we need to use this time to think. We're not going back. But where are we going? What do we want for our planet, our communities, our future? If we don't answer this question, it will be answered for us and blame shifted from the powerful to the powerless. We need each other now. We need to reflect and reset, strategize, organize, assemble, collective power. This is a network. Join, claim the future. Hi, it's John McDonald. People must have seen that film time and time again. We're going to have to get a new one. Um, just a background, the Claim the Future is an initiative we launched last year, bringing together campaigners, academics, policy researchers, think tanks to talk about the um, current state of our country, particularly in the light of the pandemic, but also after 11 years of austerity. We were looking to see whether or not we could put together uh, debates and discussions whereby campaigns were informed by research and research was informed by campaigns, praxis, theory and practice coming together. And it was intended to produce a series of policy papers um, that might influence some of the debates that were taking place about the sort of society we want to create after the pandemic. We published a whole series of policy papers. I found them extremely exciting. We fil filtered them out to various groups and people, had a range of policy debates, put them all together in one um, manifesto type draft document a couple of months ago it's all on the claim the future website have a look see what you think and give us some ideas but what we also wanted to use this vehicle for was discussion of issues as they arise as we press on through this year so one of the issues that's come up has been consistently in the debate around poverty that we've had in this initiative has been around food poverty food scarcity and people just going hungry and there's a brilliant campaign that's been launched uh, steered by ian Byrne mp will be talking later called the right to food campaign working with a whole range of groups and in parliament in the laws with shaman chakrabarti in particular um, and we thought we'd have a discussion about food strategy but we'd wait till the henry dimbleby report commissioned by the government had been published it's now been published so what we thought we'd do is we'll bring together a number of people to have a discussion about the whole issue is poverty, food poverty, government report, commissioned, campaign, where do we go from here? So that's where it is tonight. All of these, all these sessions are pretty informal uh, and we'll do some question and answer at the, at the end if we, if, we, if we can. Okay. I'm glad the colour has changed. I, I was looking at myself as though I've been suntanned all day. I'm now back to my normal pale colour. We've got a series of people who've been researching on a whole range of different aspects of poverty and child poverty and food poverty. So I'll, what we'll do is we'll invite them to talk to us about the issues of their research and the issues they're concerned, but also about the policies they think we should be pursuing. Our first speaker is Julia Brown. And Julia is the Emeritus Professor at the Thomas Coram Research Unit at UCL. Many of you will know her. Um, her focus has been recently on low paid work and in particular about the Irish community and, and Polish families in, in the UK. So over to you, Julia. Hi. Um, Rebecca O'Connell is going to speak in a minute. We've been researching food poverty in three European countries, the UK, Portugal and Norway. Um, and we've looked at that over the period following the another crisis, the crisis of the financial 2008 financial crisis. Um, and we've seen that in that crisis, those who were poorest were hit hardest. And it's clear that low and lack of income is the main driver of food poverty. Even though um, um, our government subscribes to the right to food under the economic, social and cultural rights. Um, but that is uh, lip service. Um, the, the National Food Strategy that's just been published mentions the right to food. Um, but it doesn't extend its remit to low income or doing anything about low income or wages. And our job as researchers is to collect and look at evidence 
and in our European study called Families and Food in Hard Times, um, and we've published a book free to download of the same name, by uh, published by UCL Press, we compared low-income families with children aged 11 to 15 from the UK, uh, in the UK, in Portugal, and in, Nor in Norway. We, we analyzed international data, first of all, and then we carried out qualitative research with 133 families across the three countries, both with the children and with the parents. Um, and in, our, in the international data, uh, which is the, the SILK data, um, we, we, we found that in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, 20% of families with children in the UK were income poor. And at the greatest risk of food poverty um, were um, lone parent families. And this was the case over time. Um, and compared, this was compared with um, Portugal, which is a very poor country with very low rates of benefit, and with, um, with Norway. So um, UK lone parents were at the greatest risk of food poverty. But in our, in our qualitative research with the households and families, three groups stood out. Um, lone parents on social security um, over long-term, usually over very long-term periods. So these people were in, families were in deep poverty. A second group were families with, in, in the UK with no recourse to public funds, no entitlement to paid work, to benefits, to free school meals for the children, to public housing, and so on. And a third group we found were some parents who were in paid work, but these families or parents were in insecure jobs quite often on zero hours contract, as well as being on low pay. So it's crucial that social security and wages are included if a national food strategy is to work equally for all members of society. In, in the food, national food strategy, mention is made of people lacking the means to cook, lack of space, cooking facilities, ovens and pots and pans. However, what is ignored is housing costs and housing quality. And as research from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation shows, the high costs of rented housing significantly reduces household income and so the budget that uh, parents have to spend on food. In an extra 3.1 million people in the UK are in poverty after their housing costs have been paid. And much of this housing is of poor quality, very poor quality, uh, and affects the preparation and storage of food. Another aspect of food poverty needs highlighting in the national in a national food strategy that is to work, namely that food is a multi is multi-dimension. It's got many dimensions to it. It's social and emotional, as well as material. And fundamental to society is social participation, the right to be part and to interact with other people. And food poverty excludes people from society so that they're unable to join in on social occasions that are typically organized around food. And exclusion from customary food practices leads to feelings of stigma and shame. Children as well as parents. Parents and children ought to be able to invite guests home and to allow their children to do so and to offer them hospitality. Children should be able to meet with their friends and go to their homes feeling that they can reciprocate. And in our research, 
we found that one third of parents said they couldn't afford uh, their children to have friends home or give them something uh, for, for tea or, or to give them something to eat. So we suggest that um, our suggestion is that household food budget standards research needs to be used by government so that in calculating benefits and wages um, these need to be sufficient, not only for a sustainable, adequate diet, but one that takes account of the resources needed for social participation and therefore for social inclusion, both for adults and for children. So in trusting food security to the market, as government has done, leaves food to be distributed according to means and not needs. Inadequate income leads to children and families going hungry as where the pandemic is making ever more clear. So change is needed now. And for children in some of the lowest income households um, have to depend on inadequately resourced schools uh, to step in to ensure that the children don't go hungry in school. And Rebecca is going to talk about this. Thanks, Julia. That's really helpful setting the scene. Um, I'm a bit lost because Tim Lang was going to join us, but he's under time pressure because he's double booked. I'm not sure if he, he came and joined us. And I think he's just disappeared again. Um, if he's not with us now, what we'll do is We'll go back and we'll speak to Re Rebecca now. Rebecca, um, again, really grateful for the work that she's doing. She's the, um, Rebecca O'Connell, she's the Reader of Sociology of Food and Family. She's at the Co Thomas Coram Research Unit at UCL alongside Julia. And she's the co-author of Living Hand to Mouth, Children and Food in Low-Income Families and Families and Food in Hard Times. Rebecca, over to you, okay. Thanks very much, John, for inviting us and, and thanks, Julia, for setting the scene and, and talking about the study. I'm just going to say a few words about um, what we found about school food and um, focusing mainly on the UK, because the National Food Strategy does make some recommendations on schools, as we might expect from Henry Dimbleby. Um, and I wanted to say something about what we found with respect to school meals and the adequacy or not of the recommendations in the NFS. <clears throat> so what did we find? Well, interestingly, in Portugal, as Julia said, a much poorer country, we found that almost all of the children in our sample had access to a free or a subsidised, standardised three course meal. So this included um, fresh vegetable soup, um, meat or fish or vegetarian equivalent, rice, potatoes, legumes, brown bread, vegetables or salad, some fruit or occasionally some jelly and ice cream and water. This was a real contrast, as you might expect, um, to the UK. And only around half of the children who we interviewed received a free school meal, despite living in low income. And that reflects the picture nationally, although more children have since registered for free school meals in the context of the pandemic. Um, in Norway, surprisingly for us, um, there are no school meals and we can come back to discuss that if there's time. But in, in the UK, among the 46 secondary school age children that we interviewed, they attended 16 different schools. Um, so around half of them did receive a free school meal. And in some cases, this really was a lifeline um, and the one good meal that they had each day. And in some schools, they told us about the meals being provided in an inclusive way. So um, often these what they call family style meals in which all children ate the same food and there was no payment at the point of delivery. So no kind of feeling of exclusion um, um, in, in the sense of being able to pay or not paying at the point of delivery. However, in, in other schools, um, free school meals could be delivered in a way that was stigmatizing so for example one girl told us about um, getting to the front of the queue to pay for a baguette and being told that it was um, 
she wasn't entitled to it. It was a large baguette. She was on free school meals. She could only have a small one and being sent to put it back, for example. And there were other stories like this. Um, in other cases, free school meals were considered by children and their parents to be of pretty low quality or not enough to fill them up. And because of that, parents often felt the need to provide extra cash for them to supplement the school meal. In most families, whether children received a free school meal or not, actually, mothers said that holidays were harder, um, not only because children needed to be fed, but also because they wanted money for activities, to join in activities going out. And that often involves eating out with friends, given the lack of other spaces for, for children to, to gather. About half the children, as I said, were excluded from free school meals. And among them were families in which a parent or parents were in paid work, low paid work, as Julia was saying. So in these families, the cost of school meals was a real strain on already tight family food budgets, particularly if there was more than one child. Another group who were excluded from eligibility for free school meals were those families who had no recourse to public funds, as Julia mentioned. So some schools fed children in this category using their discretionary budgets, but others didn't. Um, two boys that we spoke to in the same family talked about filling up on tinned rice pudding in the morning before they left for school so that they could endure the day on an otherwise empty stomach. They told us about going to the library at lunchtime so they didn't have to watch other people eat, other children eating, um, being told off for falling asleep in class. Um, the mother of these boys was a migrant who had worked for many years for the NHS, but her vi visa had expired and she was awaiting a decision from the Home Office on her application for indefinite leave to remain. It's scarcely believable that the words of Maud Pember Reeves, written over 100 years ago, need repeating. It's to that she said, it's to the collective interest of a nation that its children should flourish. There should be no such thing as an underfed school child. An underfed child is a disgrace and a danger to the state. So it shouldn't be left to the discretion or the responsibility of underfunded individual schools to identify and feed our hungry children. In the context of the pandemic, entitlement has been extended to some families with no recourse to public funds, but this is temporary. Provision has also been made to feed children during the school holidays. And the National Food Strategy makes some recommendations on extending this provision and extending eligibility for free school meals, which if adopted would certainly help, help more families in the immediate term. But the recommendations seem to miss a fundamental point that somebody else writing 100 years ago, Margaret Macmillan, made, that if the state insists on compulsory education, it must ensure the proper nourishment of children. Our schools should be communities that challenge the extreme inequalities in our society, not reproduce it, and this function extends to the provision of meals. So to finish up my bit, um, we want to reflect that while households need to be adequately resourced to feed themselves in dignified ways, as Julia said, other resources can be more effectively provided collectively. We would argue that school meals are one such collective resource to which all children should have the right. So thinking about school meals as a collective resource or universal basic service, if you prefer, requires not only redistribution, but a reconceptualization and a reprioritization, reprioritization of the common wealth. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm always staggered by the statistics. I'm just staggered. And also the exemplification, to be frank, the examples that you cite are the ones that most Labour MPs will be dealing with in their constituency surgeries almost on a daily basis. It's, yeah. it's just heartrending as well. And you just, and the quotes from a century ago, you just wonder how little distance we've travelled on this issue. I get angry about it. Our next speaker, thanks, thanks, Rebecca. We'll, we'll be coming back in the discussion. Our next speaker, we want to try and uh, draw in a range of international experience as well. 
um, in the in the discussion and okay. set it in a wider context too. So our next speaker, I'm really pleased, is, is Nick Freudenberg. Let me just go through the biog I've got because it's quite interesting. But Nick is director of the City University of New York Urban Policy Institute. He focuses on the impact of food and social policies on urban food environments and health inequalities. But he's the author of a new book, and it's the book of At What Cost Modern Capitalism and the Future of Health. And it studies the impact of corporate business and political practice on global health and the environment. And it's one of those issues that the health strategy doesn't address at all. Over to you, Nick. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. And as the uh, foreigner on this panel, I wanted to take a step back from the immediate questions on food insecurity and food policy that you're facing in the UK to ask a few broader questions and also to bring in uh, our experience and some of the questions that have been discussed uh, here in New York City and the United States. So the first question, what are recent changes in the global economic and political system that have affected patterns of food insecurity and diet-related diseases in the 21st century? Two, how have these changes influenced food insecurity and diet-related diseases like diabetes, heart disease, cancer, the leading causes of premature death and preventable illnesses in the US, in the UK, and increasingly around the world. Uh, how have these changes influenced uh, these outcomes in high-income countries like the UK and the US? And finally, what are some middle and long-term strategies by which we can mitigate and reverse the harmful impact of these political and economic changes. So first I wanna talk about changes in the global and political economic system. While the 21st century global food system produces more food than ever and has reduced severe malnutrition, it has left the world with four major problems. First, almost a billion people around the world wake up not knowing if they can feed themselves and their children that day staggering. Second, every day, about 2 billion people, the 30% of the world's population who are obese or overweight, and the hundreds of millions who have these diet-related diseases, every day risk consuming food or beverages that will further elevate their chance of early death or avoidable illness. Third, the global food system now contributes about one-third of the human-induced greenhouse gases, the largest single contrib contribution to global warming of any sector. And finally, by paying low wages, inadequate benefits, and no jobs and providing no job security, global food companies have lowered the price of processed food, but worsened the lives of the millions of people who grow, process, sell, and serve food for a living around the world, further exacerbating inequality and poverty. And so we ask, how did the food system that is supposed to feed and nurture people become such a threat to human well-being and survival? I think as your National Food Strategy Independent Review suggests, we can't consider these four threats separately anymore. And here are five trends that concern me. The first is monopoly concentration. Uh, increasingly, every sector in our global economy, and especially food, has become more concentrated. And how does that harm health? First, consolidation gives corporations more power to promote unhealthy or polluting products and to limit consumer choices to profitable but unhealthy options. Second, reducing competition discourages creation of small businesses that can offer healthier, more sustainable, and less expensive solutions to health and social problems. Third, consolidation gives the remaining companies more capacity to resist policies to protect public health by lobbying, making campaign contributions, and interfering in the political process in other ways. The leading cause of the global rise of chronic or non-communicable diseases, according to the World Health Organization, are tobacco, unhealthy food, and alcohol. And in each of these industries, Global consolidation has left a handful of giant firms that have the resources and expertise 
to market their unhealthy products around the world, drive out of business smaller or more innovative companies, and invest enough in product design and marketing to create hyper appealing products tailored to every untapped market, including such vulnerable populations as children, older people, women, recent immigrants, and low income groups. One consequence of giant firms buying up smaller companies or forcing them out of business by lowering prices is that companies like Coke, Pepsi, and Dr. Pepper take over the small healthy drinks company and either withdraw their products from the market or promote them as one more niche choice in their beverage portfolio dominated by sugary sodas. And we've seen in your national report how damaging to health these sugary beverages are. Finally, market concentration gives the few remaining giant companies the revenues and skills they need for campaign contributions, lobbying, and public relations campaigns that they need to resist local, state, national, and global public health measures to limit their capacity to make a profit. So one key strategy for improving diets is to reduce monopoly control. The second trend is financialization. As overproduction and falling demand limited opportunities for profit, investors looked for new ways to increase returns on their capital. Financialization defined as patterns of accumulation in which uh, profit making increasingly occurs through financial channels rather than through trade or commodity production has now become a major influence on individuals and families, governments and businesses. Profiting from financial speculation turned into an end in itself, a way to increase return on investment and shareholder value. The development of commodities futures markets for beef, grain, and other foods is one way that the new speculation economy has led to increases in food prices and in some countries, food shortages and actually food riots. Financialization affects interest rates, debts, access to markets, financial stability, and financial security, and the ups and downs of the economic cycle triggered by financialization have worsened the lives of so many people around the world. Here in the United States, the proportion of corporate profits that come from the financial industry increased from 20% in 1980 to 40% in 2000 a staggering increase. The third trend is the increased control of globalization. Our economy has been globalized for centuries, but what is different now is how quickly money, goods, and services, and people, as well as pathogens, can zoom around the world. What is also different is how much the rules for the new globalization and global trade are set not by governments, but by corporations themselves, who look to set rules that maximize opportunities for profit. It's like the football team members replaced the referees and linesmen to call the plays and fouls. The fourth trend is deregulation. In the 70s and 80s, many high income countries, and especially in response to the uh, regulations uh, encouraged by social and labor movements to protect health, workers, safety, look to roll back those regulations. And businesses and wealthy individuals have sought to change the rules to benefit them. In the food sector, deregulation has left food safety in jeopardy, increased the power of corporations to self-regulate it, and provided space for voluntary public-private partnerships. You've seen some of these in the UK. Agreements that often serve to burnish corporate images rather than protect public health, or is to serve as alternatives to mandatory effective regulations. And the final trend I'll talk about is the increased corporate control of science and technology. In the last 50 years, corporations have increasingly seized control of emerging science and technology to exploit for profit, even if such use jeopardizes human and planetary health. And I think the use of food reformulation and ultra processing by the food industry are illustrations of how control of science and technology by the food industry has ended up harming uh, the health of people and the planet rather than benefiting them. I wanted to end by suggesting 
uh, a few strategies by which I think we can together uh, begin to reverse these uh, damaging changes. First, I think we need to find new ways to bring to con together constituencies and movements that share common interests. And I wanted to give us an, exa an example in New York City. A few years ago, we were successful in uh, persuading city government to make universal free lunches uh, available to all children in the New York City schools. It was a long battle, it took about five years, but we won because we were able to bring together parents groups, teachers groups and other labor unions, uh, public health groups, uh, the food justice movement and others. And together, those groups were able to overcome those who had been looking to maintain the differential pricing that had characterized our previous. And in the time of the pandemic, that movement that emerged to make uh, free lunches universal in our school system uh, further extended that by making uh, by using schools as a place to distribute free meals, not just to children in those schools, but to their families and even to their neighbors, making uh, the right to food a public right and a public responsibility rather than simply charity. I think these uh, moves also illustrate a second recommendation, which is to grow the public sector, as was also discussed in the uh, national food strategy. We need to look to government procurement power as a way of ensuring that the billions of dollars or pounds that the government already spends in the public sector is used in fact to benefit the public and not food corporations. A third recommendation is we need to start to talk about capitalism. I actually looked over the uh, food sector report. 289 pages, the word capitalism was used once. And unfortunately, too many of us who work in social campaigns, in health, in human services, are afraid or reluctant to use the word capitalism. And that's sort of like physicians being reluctant or afraid to use the word human body. Uh, capitalism as it's evolved in the 21st century is a driving force of patterns in health and of disease. And whether we love capitalism, hate it, or have a more nuanced set of views, we need to talk about it. We need to talk about it as a system. We need to identify its characteristics that contribute to health and disease. And I'm hoping we can, all of us on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, widen that discussion. Fourth, I think we need to, uh, protect and expand democracy. It's democracy that ensures that all voices can participate in creating a healthy society. And here in the United States, uh, disenfranchised people have lost a voice in shaping our food system and looking for ways to restore those voices at the municipal level, at the regional level, and at the national and global levels, I think are important strategies. Fifth, we need to defend science and evidence. Uh, there's a growing trend. We saw it in our, uh, in our president and our national government in the last administration to attack science as the enemy, to attack evidence as an obstacle to progress. And I think all of us need to be sure that we understand that human progress comes about as a result of science and evidence. That science and evidence has to be controlled by the public and by people, and we need to be able to distinguish between uh, evidence that can move things forward and uh, self-serving interpretations that look to advance political interests or corporate interests. And finally, as I think uh, this panel and the broader effort to inform, improve our food system illustrate, we need to insist that another world is possible. I've been talking about these issues for a long time, and I find not so many people disagree that the political and economic system we have now is profoundly damaging to health. Many people agree. Look at climate change. Look at food insecurity and diet-related diseases. Look at the COVID pandemic. Who could disagree? But what people feel is that there's no alternative, that no other uh, world exists. And I think together we need to uh, show that a different world is possible. Thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing the rest of the discussion.
Wow. wow. Thanks, Nick. Thanks ever so much. Wow. You've covered a huge vista of issues. That's terrific. We'll come back to the discussion. Um, I think the the way we'll approach this is our next speaker is, is I'll give you her titles, Professor Emeritus of Public Health, London Metropolitan University. Arlene and Nick, are the, they're the co-authors of the book, A Tale of Two Obesities, Comparing Responses to Childhood Obesity in London and New York City. And we'll come back because I want to try and get Eileen and Nick taking us through some of the wider discussion they've had. But Eileen, the best thing that Eileen ever did to me is she introduced me to Richard Wilkinson many, many years ago. And it was the introduction to the, the link between public health and inequality, but then also other societal problems in, in terms of inequality as well. Um, Richard went on to then cover Cape Pickett, and some of you will know, launched the spirit level. It was just, it did form the basis of a lot of our thinking in the drafting of the last couple of manifestos. Eileen, over to you. And Tony Atkinson. Remember Tony Atkinson, who was the teacher of Piketty, which is very important because Atkinson was the person who really developed all the issues about inequality in health that had to do with concentrations of wealth and the fact that um, the inequalities that exist had a lot more to do with the concentrations of health, of wealth, and particularly the, the, the disparity in assets that people have. Now, can I say when Nick and our team worked together in London, we, came, we looked, we were doing this just at the point when the financial crisis took place in 2008 and we carried on for a few years. We came up with 11 strategies about what we should do about obesity and concluded that some of the things that are still considered to be radical had to be done then, had to be done by 2010. For instance, we needed the standards in public procurement. We needed universal free school meals and so on. Now, the reason I mention at all the work that we did on obesity was simply because my prediction is that when the government comes to look at the Dimbleby strategy, what they will do is not look at the big issues that we have been discussing and the issues that have to do with inequalities and the inequalities inside family formation that Julia and Rebecca have shown us or anything to do with the big issues that, uh, that Nick has shown us. What they will do will direct our attention again to the obesity issue. And my one of the things that we discovered in 2018, when John uh, McDonald asked us to help produce a piece of work on how a future labor government would be able to end child poverty, what we found was at exactly that time, Theresa May, the then prime minister, made a claim that overweight and obesity is the biggest threat to the health and well being of our children that critically determines their opportunities in life. That opened the doors to all of those subsequently, many of whom involved in nudge thinking, many of whom looking at social psychological models that went back to the notion that it is individuals, families, and at best communities that would be able to address the issue without any of the reference to the kind of academic and activist um, developments that had taken place around the idea of the obesogenic environment, where the obesogenic environment conception was based on the idea that there is a holistic analysis available to us that takes us literally from farm and sea to fork. And so what, what at, at, um, when John 
wanted to have an analysis of what has happened since the, the, the pledge put forward by the previous Labour government that we would end child poverty by 2020, John said to us, whole group of groups of people, go have a look and tell us about it. So um, Sharon Noonan Gunning and I had a look again at obesity simply because that was coming back onto the agenda as late as 2018, 2019, in the run up to 2020. And in fact, we heard constant claims by the person who was just going to give up as chief executive of the NHS, that what is going to destroy the NHS is going to be conditions like obesity. And he said, yes, we should have prevention, but his prevention did not point us in the direction of an analysis of the whole of the obesogenic environment. When Sharon and I looked at what is happening about obesity and how is it that it keeps on becoming the priority, we just looked around at the kind of information that was available to all of us in relation to what the United Kingdom was doing in comparison to other wealthy countries. And one of the things that we found was that there was study after study after study of comparative work that was done on well being in groups of children and so on. One of the studies that was produced by the Nuffield Trust in 2019 looked at 19 high income countries, high income countries, and looked at a whole set of issues affecting the 10 to 24 year olds. And what they came up with was the following, that if you look at the UK in comparison with our comparative, con comparative countries, and I'm going to read you a list of the issues that we were, that uh, Nuffield examined. Obesity prevalence, long-standing illness, exercise in England and Wales, material deprivation. What they found, and they looked at some other issues as well, ad adolescent birth rate, asthma death rate, and so on. What they actually found was that the UK in comparison with countries like us from the point of view of wealth, UK was worse on obesity, yes, no wonder Mrs. May was worried. We were worse than our comparators on long-standing illness. We didn't get as, our children didn't get as much exercise. But we were worse as well in terms of material deprivation of our children. Furthermore, they looked at what was happening to these aspects of children's life conditions. Were they stable? Were they getting better or were they getting worse? Again, the UK trend over the past decade showed that obesity prevalence had gotten worse. Long-standing illness for children had gotten worse. Children were engaging in less physical exercise and material deprivation had gotten worse. Now, given the fact that in, in those cases, all of those conditions were getting worse, which would you clump together and which would you prioritize in order to formulate a policy? Well, you could go right back to obesity. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's exactly what the government does when it comes to write its reply to Dimbleby. And they will have plenty of academic work produced by social psychologists that tell us how to do that and help parents to do that and help communities to do that. So when John 
asked us, well, what, what do we think the issues are? We really thought that what we needed to identify was that the climate change damaging food system and inequalities in wealth are greater threats to our children's health than any of the issues that have all that have been identified by the current government and are likely to be picked up in the policy formation in response to Dimbleby. Now, I won't say more except to say that it really upset me enormously when I read the Dimble, I, I mean, uh, while I think there are lots of good things in the Dimble re B report, it upset me enormously when I saw that he was suggesting that GPs should be empowered to be able to give prescriptions for healthy food for people who couldn't access it in any other way. It seems to me that's pretty pathetic. Um, we can move on from there. Thanks, Arlene. Thanks, Arlene. Thanks for reminding me of Tony Atkinson as well. What a man. People, you meet people almost saints in this world. Tony was one of them. He worked with us even when he was yes. near to death. Even when yes. he's near to death. Yes. On equality, such an inspiration. And man. can I make one point about mm. Atkinson, precisely because he was Piketty's PhD supervisor? Yeah. yeah. Atkinson produced his book on inequality producing 20 feasible proposals for dealing with the inequalities in the UK. The economist said, all of this makes sense. It's totally feasible. No government would do it. Yeah, it was the Over handbook. It was a handbook, though, because we did, if you remember in 2018, you did with me um, the State of the Economy Conference. That's right. And I think you were on with Selma James and a whole range of people at the time. Yeah. But yeah. the Atkinson book then was the handbook in which we were developing the policy. Yeah. Right. Our next speaker is um, Ian Byrne, MP. Ian's the MP for <clears throat> West Derby in Liverpool. He came into Parliament on the last uh, election. And Ian has basically, well, apart from being a brilliant local MP and these interventions in Parliament, some of you need to look at them. They're really effective. But also what he's done is he's taken the issue about the right to food and he's run with it. And he's built it. It's the point that Nick was saying earlier, the New York example. He's tried to take the issue, making sure we've got all the research behind us, of course, but then take it into a campaigning approach um, to, mo to, I think, identify who can be mobilised how we mobilise and what the demands should be. And I, I'm not, it's so impressive, it really is. Ian, take us through the work that you've been doing. Th uh, thanks for that, John, and, and, and thanks for inviting me onto this uh, Claim the Future. Yeah, I mean, it's quite humbling to be in, 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 in such a esteemed company, and I've been absolutely blown away by, by what I've heard over the last hour, and there's lots and lots to digest uh, from every speaker, and I, I really look forward to continuing on our work together. I think from our perspective, obviously, we're here to maybe talk about the national food strategy, and I'd focus on, obviously, the right to food elements of it and the campaign, so... Just to give people a quick overview, uh, the Right to Food campaign, it basically started from our perspective in September last uh, year uh, with regards a clear focus on the national food strategy. I've been tackling uh, food poverty within Liverpool since 2015 when I helped to set up Fan Support and Food Banks, which was a which is an organisation which just asks, asks football fans to collect food. So working with Dave Kelly and Robbie Daniels, the two Evertonians, I'm the Liverpoolian. Uh, we just asked Liverpool and Everton fans to come together and donate a tin of food. Really humble beginnings in 2015. We had a really been where people put food in. But from that, it's grew. It, the, the idea and the ethos has grew and it's spread throughout the country. And it's really important that we understand that because what we've done, we set up a national food supporters network. So we've got people right throughout the country uh, allied to using football as a means of collecting food for their communities, but also educating, uh, telling people why we've actually got to do this. You know, food banks shouldn't exist in one of the richest societies in the world. So it's been an education process, speaking to fans, and it's been a long journey. 
But what we did, we built up a collective, we built up solidarity, real working class solidarity between football clubs and football supporters who previously been very sectarian. And what we hopefully tried to show them was the bigger picture. So Manchester United, Liverpool fans working together, Everton, City, Newcastle, the whole country coming together under the National Food uh, uh, National Food Supporters uh, Network. And that's key because last year we carried on what we were doing because we wanted to keep the right to food in the manifesto, uh, which John was magnificently involved with and lots of people on here for two, uh, 219. It was in the manifesto. We wanted to keep it in the next Labour Party manifesto when it came into Parliament. But then I sit on the Africa committee and Henry Dimbleby came before us and we did about the, the seeing the first part of the national food strategy. But when Henry done the, uh, he, he came before the Africa committee as a witness, we seen the second part was an unbelievable opportunity to really push, really push Henry to include the rights of food into that. We just felt it was an open goal. The first, uh, the first witness session Henry did, he dismissed the right to food. He didn't think that it was needed. So it was a case we knew what we had to do. We had to work on them and we had to galvanise a campaign. And Nick spot on, absolutely spot on about bringing everybody together. And I think one of the proudest things that we've done as a campaign uh, under the, uh, the banner of the uh, 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 Fan Support and Food Bank Network is to bring many different groups. So we've got organisations like Acorn, we've got faith leaders, we've got sports leaders, uh, we've got, you name it, we've got people who've come together under the uh, banner of the Right to Food. What we did then in January, uh, we, we set a petition up which got 53,000 signatures, but then we started moving a, a motion through councils so councils could de uh, de declare themselves right to food uh, areas. That started in Liverpool in January and that spread throughout the country. I mean, like wildfire uh, throughout the country with regions declare themselves right to food because 10 million people who can't afford to put a meal on the table is from Durham to Brighton, it's right across the, uh, every constituency, right across the area, so the interest in that was phenomenal and we've seen it grow and grow and grow then we got the trade union movement involved Unite, GMB NEU, the Bakers Union CWU, they've all been fantastic in promoting this and others you know, in, in the entire trade union movement's been behind this uh, a campaign special mention to the bakers who've been marvelous as have unite in, in really taking it and, can, and running with it but it was really important that we could actually create a movement which wasn't seen as like a labor mp plus pigeon being able to be pigeonholed uh, as justice like you know red versus blue attack you know even though it is a very political campaign because food poverty is political however we didn't want it uh, be able to be pigeonholed, so we had to create this entire movement. So, one of our proudest achievements was last month when Totes in Devon, uh, which is a Lib Dem council, uh, it's got a Conservative MP, uh, wrote to wrote to me and said we declared ourselves a, a right to food area. Now, there's you know that's probably away from the activism that I'm involved in through fa uh, football and and everything else. You know, it's an area that we, we haven't really uh, focused on, even though that is suffering immeasurable amount of uh, poverty and food poverty obviously during the uh, COVID pandemic so that was a real example uh, of how this can be achieved you know when as Nick said build up this massive support so the idea was always I was driving it politically and trying to bring that together the coalition of MPs on the ground we had fan support and food banks through the football fans the network that we uh, that we built over the years come together and it was a dual push on Henley uh, and the national food strategy. The motions going through, everything was targeted to ask Henry Dimbleby to put the right to food in the national food strategy. So last week, when it was published, it was published on Thursday. Uh, we met Henry on the Wednesday and he hadn't had sight of it. But he said, what we've done, we've included uh, some nods towards what you asked for. So in the 17th of March, after lots of consultation, building up this movement, Zoom calls from one end of the country to the other, uh, getting people's opinions on what the right to food should be, we submitted uh, a submission to the National Food Strategy. Me and Shami Chakrabarti, he's been absolutely amazing in this, uh, pulling it together with us. Sat down with Andy and we submitted it. And what it was, five elements, and really interesting before listening to Rebecca, it was universal free school meals, community kitchens, uh, because 
true austerity. We've seen, you know, we've seen the devastation uh, of, of resources shutting down. And we felt as though schools should be open to probably sometimes the only uh, option that people have got it within the community. And if the doors shut at half four, five o'clock, what a resource lost. So we wanted to open that up, community kitchens. Also key was getting uh, a statutory duty where the minister had to tell parliament how he believed there was a reasonable portion in benefits and wages uh, to ensure that everybody could have a healthy, nutritious diet. Because we know, obviously, through uh, austerity and the, the reformation of the welfare state, how that's affected and drove uh, food poverty. So there is also ensured food security. There's many food deserts across uh, the country. I'm a council in Everton uh, ward in Liverpool, and that's that that's acknowledged as one uh, as a food desert. Uh, so we wanted to uh, stand it in planning. You know, we want, we were really ambitious in what we did, and then independence enforcement. So then five elements we felt as though were the starting point of what a right to food should mission uh, should look like. So David and Henry addressed us last week uh, and said we touched on them. And, you know, I think Henry's got the best intentions at heart. I think he's been stymy politically uh, by, uh, obviously, the Conservative government. And he's, he's probably gone for what he believes he can uh, achieve. Now, the, though the whole document, there's some excellent uh, uh, elements of it. However, from a right to food uh, campaign and perspective, it was extremely disappointing. He did touch on what we asked for, you know, but I think, as as Rebecca said, you know, Universality and free school meals should be the building block of where we are with, with, with the right to food, and that's why we that's why we put it in. We made such a, a you know a, a big big play on it. You know, healthy balanced meals have such a huge difference, you know, to a child's health, education, but also taking away the stigma with universality where children can sit down. I mean, years picked up when we're talking about Portugal giving children three course meals i mean what a difference that would make you know to people in in my constituency the millions of kids that are uh, facing poverty how about how would that be fantastic to bring communities together the children sitting down together breaking bread together i mean that is an enlightened society and that's what we should be pushing for you know that sort of radical thinking was what we wanted to see in this this is what we were hoping for Nick made a really good point, and I, I actually wrote this down before uh, before we started listening. and And the disappointment was that we needed radical, radical solutions, you know, to reverse the damage wreaked by austerity, welfare reform, and capitalism. <laughs> I wrote that down before he said it. Absolutely, you know, with insecure work, low pay, zero hour contracts. You know, these have all been a huge element to where we are now, with over ten million people who can't put a, a meal on the table. So for me. The real disappointment uh, of the national food strategy was that it didn't challenge the systemic failings of what I see in my community every week, what we see across the country, everything that we hear and see. It didn't tackle the systemic failings. It tinkered around the edges. And for me, that's why it was such a missed opportunity. Now, from a campaign perspective, we go on. He did mention uh, the right to food within the, uh, within the, within the document. He said, Henry said he's going to do something separate to 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 uh, to answer some of the criticisms and to talk about the right to food and how he believes the national food strategy. He answered what we asked for within the submission. So I welcome that. And I actually look forward to having that debate with him. Uh, but it was a missed opportunity. And I just wish he'd have been as radical as some of the uh, items that Nick was outlining before and what Rebecca talked about. And I'm hoping that the next... Labour government listens to what we're proposing. The Lax Labour manifesto is as radical as some of the suggestions that have been done in here because the only way we reverse the damage that's been done to our society is radical socialist policies. Thanks, John. Thanks, Ian. I'm really grateful for that. Um, Tim has been emailing us and texting us and he's been trying to get on about a dozen times and it's not working. Um, but what he's done is he's sent over the brief he was going to use. So what I'll do, oh, it's a nightmare this, but what I'll do is I'll go back to Tim. And if he's happy, what we'll do is we'll take the paper he's done and put it on the Claim the Future website so people can download that and have a look at it from there. I can sense his frustration in the um, in the emails, et cetera, for the number of times he's tried. Um, I, every time this happens, I try to remember the name of that person who suggested universal free broadband, but 
whatever happened to him anyway. Okay. Could, um, Dan, could we bring everyone on screen now? Is that possible? Dan Lewis does all the techno technology in the background, which is brilliant. Thanks, Dan. We've got a few minutes, so let's just go through some of the issues that have been, been raised there. Um, how do, let me throw a question in, basically. Um, Ian and I are Labour MPs. Obviously, what we do is we look to the Labour Party to go, try and get into government with a, with a radical programme that, that will challenge some of these issues in the way that Eileen was developing the policy for us last time. Nick, just coming to you, what's happened in the States? With regard, has the Biden administration taken any of these issues up? Or are, are the sort of the left within the Democrats doing anything along these lines? Yes, I think there's, uh, as is always the case, great promise and great disappointment in the <laughs> Biden administration. I think uh, it was a huge victory uh, to defeat Trump, to uh, get a majority of the American people to vote Trump out and to vote that dark, ugly, future for our country. Uh, and I think, as it turned out, uh, Biden turned out to be a, a person who could bring together the different constituency that uh, achieved that victory. I also think that there are a number of more radical proposals, including in food that are being developed in the Biden administration. There's the beginning of a new level of support for black farmers and small farmers. Uh, and public policy in the US has disadvantaged those groups uh, terribly. Uh, there's been a big expansion uh, of the SNAP program, reversing the Trump administration and the Republicans' efforts to really uh, dismantle that program and uh, hamstring it. I also think, uh, and, uh, You'll, you all will have to decide whether this is a model for the UK. Although there's been sharp debate between the left and center within the Democratic Party, they've also agreed on some things and moving forward uh, what we call an infrastructure package, uh, a set of social policies that are both traditional infrastructure, but also uh, revitalizing the safety net. And those are huge steps forward uh, to address uh, poverty, the uh, a new uh, uh, federal benefit for people who have children. It's temporary. That's a problem, but offers to dramatically reduce the number of children living in poverty. And that's after years and years of uh, no progress on that. In fact, of uh, poverty increasing. But you know, as uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt said when uh, he was first elected and he met with a group of progressives and labor movements, he said, you know, and they said, well, we want you to do this, this and this. And he said, make me do it. You know, and I think uh, here in the United States, it is the progressive movements, the labor movement, Black Lives Matter, the food movement, uh, the environmental movement that will force Biden uh, reinforce the more progressive Democrats. And that's uh, a task we're involved in now. And we don't know yet how it will play out. The 2022 elections uh, will be an important step forward. But we're much more optimistic than we were two yeah. years ago. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's really helpful. We're, we're about to face a cut in our universal credit, 20 pounds a week coming off people. And it's going to be savage already. Who wants to come in on, on some of the ideas that Nick put forward? Julia, Rebecca? What do you think, both of you, in terms of what we need to be doing? In the, in the chat, someone said, is this, you know, have we included the real demand for living wage, for example, in the campaign, or universal basic income, or how do we tackle the whole issue of poverty? Well, we've, we've clearly got to do it now. Mm. I mean, we've got to raise these, you know, we've got, <laughs> which is what Ian's doing, but um, the Labour Party also has to take a lead. And I think we've said before, Rebecca and I, that 
you know, it seems uh, you said actually that, that universal free school meals is a win-win. Um, and, you know, it's quite possible that something, I mean, it won't be universal, but Johnson might do something vaguely along those lines and, and the Labour Party is going to look rather foolish. Mm. Rebecca? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking uh, when Nick was talking about the example of New York, that we do have some examples of local authorities who have taken matters into their own hands, really, you know, without budget to do it, mm. um, and are offering universal school meals in primary schools at the moment and planning to expand those and using them not only to ensure that children are eating well, but to ensure that people are paid the real living wage to drive up the school food standards and so forth. So community wealth building. Um, the problem is, I think, that it's very difficult to measure. I mean, I'm not a quantitative social scientist, but very difficult to measure the effects of these things and show their kind of economic benefits. So people ask, how much will that cost? Well, you know, what are the costs of not doing it? you know is what we need mm. to think about this you know mm. schools are a major opportunity that we have to not only you know to, to feed our children and to, to help families but also to influence them and shape their kind of food preferences so it just seems madness not to be doing it yeah the, the worry i've got and, and just the point that eileen made is that we're gonna we are gonna go around the same loop about obesity and I think that's what Johnson is, you can hear it in some of the language he's using already. And so we're going to go around that loop. And at the same time, I, um, the, I've made the point to Ian, is that if I look at Rishi Sunak, he might do something around school meals a bit, but that's to head off the campaign on the universal credit cut. And I think that's what we've got to, we've got to be subtle about how we analyse what they're doing to us. But at the same time, it is, you know, I think Julia is right. The point is, there's almost an open goal here for the Labour Party to really get on top of. I think Universal Free School Meals is such a popular campaign. Someone's put in the chat that in the 1950s, a number of schools did this anyway. I'm, I'm so ancient. I was a child in the, in the 1950s in British schools. But I think what was happening then is that so many people were below the level um, in, the, in terms of income that they did qualify for free school meals. It was much, it was almost a universal in some areas, if you like, because of that. But there was, it was still stigmatizing to a large extent as well. And that was the whole point. I mean, just tactically, what do you think are the best arguments we can now use? Well, I think one of the things that's really important is to pick up one of Nick's ideas that he didn't mention today, which is healthy food jobs. Yeah. Um, the idea now, also, I think in I, I, I think I'm correct in saying that uh, Tim said that mm. we've got 4.3 million people in the food uh, the food economy. Yeah. If you take if you go all the way from our fisheries, our the agriculture, all the way to the hospitality industry, right? All the way to the people who work in the pubs and serve in the pubs and so on. We've got a very, very large. Is is the sound okay? Yes, it is. It's, it's okay. your, you so, can hear the ice cream van in. Oh, is that what it is? Okay, I thought it was me. Um, I'll get you a, I'll okay, get you a the idea of right. healthy food jobs and looking what a significant proportion of the population are working in the food industry and the conditions in which they work. Because one of the key things that you expect the Labour Party to do is to be looking at work. Yeah. And, and you know, Rebecca, Julia are, you know, taking it, move the thing way beyond production, all to include everything to do with yeah. caring and the rest of it. So I think that's very, very important. The notion of healthy food jobs and hook it up to, you know, the people who actually uh, worked with John as well. Unison was involved in, yeah. in getting our publication together on how do you, what do you do 20 years later after Labour promised to get rid of child poverty. They've got 1.3 million people. 
a very significant proportion of their members are working in what's called public services, a huge proportion of which are contracted out. Yeah. We okay. have such a problem of a fractionated workforce right across the mm -hmm. board mm -hmm. where we're dealing with food. It would be nice if we could, you know, start with thinking about the food that happens inside the school meal service mm -hmm. and it's, and going back because I'm a bit older than you going back to when uh, Livingston ran the inner London education authority, the school meal service was actually was actually a yeah. real innovator. And I can tell you, I had relations of mine and my husband who were working as dinner ladies at St. Aloysius School up the road who were telling us how much they learned from being part of the school meal service that existed on the Livingston. Yeah. It could happen. Yeah, on the well, I was the chair of finance then, and Tim Lang yes. was one of our advisors. Yes, that, that's why I couldn't understand anyone in government couldn't draw upon that experience. Absolutely, Tim, Tim did the food commission, and, and it was it was the first attempt actually to almost go from production right onto the plate. Etc. That's right, Ian. You've got the bakers union involved, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, yeah, they've been magnificent, John, uh, with regards uh, their element of the campaign is obviously low wages and the people who are actually producing the food can't afford to, to eat the food and, and forced into food banks. And there's there's many examples of that, uh, working with the IWGB as well, with the yeah. gig economy. You know, when a lot of these uh, big companies that are uh, shipping food across our cities, uh, you see them on the back of the football sign, uh, the football supporters, you know, and saying what they've done for the communities. And a lot of the workers are actually accessing food banks because of the awful terms and conditions. So I think, I think when we talk politically, I think there's a real opportunity uh, for the Labour Party to, to, to take a grip of this. And, you know, we look at universal free school meals because it's something I'm obsessed about, uh, mm -hmm. truly are, because it's, it's the building block for me. It's an investment, John. It's an investment, and then we look at the procurement. There's 8.9 million children in the in the uh, in the UK. Um, your community wealth building. You could have local authorities building. You know, building around the procurement element to it, making sure that the uh, the kids are you know are fed. What a holistic circle that could be. You know, what a what an absolutely easy. Own, uh, opportunity for for the party to do something really radical, but also that would chime with every person in this country. For me, that's that's that should be one of our key manifesto pledges. I think it it'll cut through, and it's achievable. But it does so many other elements to it, doesn't it? You know, it, as I said, investments in local communities, investments in the children gives us a real opportunity to really tackle food uh, poverty uh, at its at its systemic roots. So that's something which I will be pushing for. I've had a conversation with Luke Pollard today uh, and I'm going to uh, go really big on that to be honest and, and everybody in the campaign as well it's one of the five key elements but it's uh, it's something which we all should be pushing for so that's why it's such a delight to work on uh, on this sort of platforms with people who believe in that as well and see the benefits of it. If I can add uh, coming back to the earlier discussion around food labour there's a lot of I think positive and exciting uh, new organising in the food labor sector, particularly the low wage and precarious food workers. Uh, fast food workers have organized and won uh, minimum wages in cities and states around the country up to $15 an hour. A lot of resistance uh, initially, and they've been able to get the political support to overcome that resistance. Uh, we're doing at my institute, we're doing a session on uh, food labor perspectives on revitalizing New York City's economy next week. Uh, the details, uh, I hope, will be in the chat, and we invite you all to join that. And I think uh, in the United States, uh, food workers were designated essential workers during the pandemic, and we're very interested in that concept of essential workers. Well, what does it mean, and what do we need to change? If food workers low-wage food workers are essential workers, then what do you have to pay them? What benefits do you have to give them? How do you have to protect their health and safety, their right to organize? Uh, and I, I believe these are powerful issues 
for bringing together, again, the many constituencies who are uh, hurt by our dysfunctional food system. The, the Baker's Union led on launching the fast food campaign. This was oh, six or seven years ago now here, but we do, we participated as well in the global McDonald's campaign as well, right? Which was incredibly effective. Mm -hmm. and, for, and for the first time we were forcing recognition on individual franchises, et cetera. Mind you, it took, um, how do, I'm being diplomatic here. It took a bit of persuasion of some of the, the what you call the historic or mainstream unions, that this was an issue. And that's why right, like IWGB and others, mm -hmm. the smaller unions, more active at that time, um, were, were groundbreaking. But now this, the, the major unions are beginning to come on, well, dramatically on board. Ian, do you want to come in? Yeah, just just on that point, Johnny, if you look at Fire and Beer, yeah, you know, the, what, what it does by driving people yeah. into food poverty from a trade union perspective, that's right. I mean, the bakers have been really good on that. They're building a the campaign, obviously, around low pay and the ability not to be able to, to eat the food they're producing. Again, you know, when I've said this to the other trade unions, wonderful opportunity for the attacks on terms and conditions, what that actually means, because it cuts through to the public. You know, if you've got an insecure gig, work, uh, gig economy worker who's taking food to your home, but then he's got to go to a food bank. I mean, what a message that sends out that the system's completely broken. So I think there's a wonderful opportunity uh, for trade unions to actually utilise this and, as Nick said, build on better terms and conditions and really coalesce around that issue, but also build a, U a really broad coalition moving forward to obviously tackle the systemic uh, failings that we're seeing and why people, uh, I think it's 60% who, who use food banks, food pantries are in work. So, you know, there's, there's a systemic issue there, and I think it can be used really powerfully to tackle that. There's a huge coalition potential. Um, I've got to go off. I've got to go and see a group of disgruntled constituents about what's <laughs> happening in their street, the environment and other matters, and I've, I've put it off a little bit to be able to do this, so i better go and see them. But I'm always late. That's why they call me the late John McDonnell all the time, I'm afraid. But um, can I thank everyone, uh, Julia and Rebecca and Nick and Eileen, thanks ever so much. And Ian, of course, just are just inspiring us. Okay. Um, what we'll do is on the Claim the Future website, we'll put Tim's note up if he's happy with that. I'm sorry he couldn't get through, but there'll be other discussions like this. Um, but also what we'll try and do, Nick, we'll link up as well on the international linkages as well with yourself and Eileen as well to see that I think the issue for me is exactly what Ian's doing is inspiring people about how together around a limited set of demands but could be real breakthroughs but we want to do that from a real understanding the work that Rebecca and Julia and Eileen yourself have done is quite important because it lays the foundations for a rational argument that is insuperable you know that it cannot be argued against and we're sometimes in in the politics that we have at the moment, you might have got rid of Trump, but we've got our own sort of posh Trump in control here. And r rationality of just political debate is not necessary. <laughs> I'm trying to be diplomatic here as I can really. But I th so what we're trying to do is build up people's confidence about how they understand the world, but then also what the solutions are. So we'll keep in touch. Thanks ever so much for giving up your time. I hope, well, I've learned a lot from it and I hope other people have as well. Okay, all the best. Bye. Bye. We need to use this time to think. We're not going back. But where are we going? What do we want for our planet, our communities, our future? If we don't answer this question, it will be answered for us and blame shifted from the powerful to the powerless. We need each other now. We need to reflect and reset, strategize, organize, assemble, collective power. This is a network. Join, claim the future.